Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and welcome back to Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. Always an honor to have you with us. As Catholics, our non-Catholic brethren, and God bless them, we know they mean well, will often claim that our faith is not based on the Bible and is even contrary to it. Well, the next time a friend holds up the Bible and says to you, your Catholic faith is not biblical, you may want to ask them, do you know where that Bible actually comes from? We are Back in the early centuries of Christianity, there were many letters and gospels that were floating around amongst the Christians, such as the Gospels of Peter, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas. And by the way, St. Peter, St. Thomas, and Mary did not write those gospels. They were simply named in their honor and written by other authors, some unknown. So, who determined the only Gospels that were inspired by the Holy Spirit and were to be included in the Bible were those of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Who determined what 27 books went into our current New Testament Bible that all Christians use today, even non-Catholics? The answer the Catholic Church. This is because Christ gave his authority to the church in Matthew 16 when he established it and gave Peter the keys to heaven. So the church over history has exercised this authority given by God to show us what the truth is. Otherwise, everyone would have their own opinion regarding what is inspired by God or not. No, the church was not hiding the true Bible by removing these other books, as the History Channel might often suggest. They were simply books determined not to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the Catholic Church did not add books to the Old Testament, as non-Catholics also claim, because it was Martin Luther who removed those books from the original canon. Books such as Wisdom, Sirach, Maccabees, etc., because he didn't like what they taught, such as praying for the dead. So again, where did the Bible come from? Well, God, of course. But the Bible didn't simply fall out of the sky, fully written with a shiny cover. God used the men he appointed to carry on his work after his ascension, and that is what the church has done. Through her authority at the councils of Carthage and Hippo back in 393 and 397 AD, it was the Catholic Church who put together the Bible as we know it today. Yes, the same Bible Protestants use today. So you see, the Bible is a Catholic book. And why was the Bible as a selected set of books and letters created in the first place? Well, as we said on our show a few weeks ago, the Bible was created to be read at the Mass. The Mass predates the Bible by 350 years. So how then did the Christian faith get handed down over those same 350 years when there was no official Bible to use at the time? The faith was passed on through the church. Therefore, you cannot accept the Bible and reject the authority from which it came, which is the Catholic Church. That would be like accepting the United States Constitution and then rejecting the Founding Fathers from whom it came. We need an authority to guard and interpret any document that determines how people are to live. That is why the Supreme Court, when it works correctly, interprets the Constitution. Otherwise, there would be chaos with everyone interpreting it differently. It is the same with the church and the Bible. Even St. Peter said of St. Paul, quote, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. This is 2 Peter 3.16. There can only be one truth. 
If we don't have a magisterium of the church, we would interpret the Bible 40,000 different ways, and that is the problem that came after the Protestant Reformation. But how can the Bible come from the Catholic Church? Didn't the church burn Bibles, chain them to rocks so nobody could have them, and put them into Latin so nobody could read them? Did the church really do these things? Yes, but as with everything, we have to look at the full context. First, the Catholic Church did burn Bibles, but not the true Bible. What does the government do when it finds counterfeit money? It burns it to protect the real money. The church only burned the false gospels we mentioned earlier, not the inspired true Bible of God. Second, did the church chain Bibles to rocks? Yes, because this was before the printing press was invented, and it took up to three years for a scribe to copy a single Bible. It was very valuable, so if it was left out in the public square, it would have quickly disappeared. Instead, the church chained it to a main rock so everyone could read it. Y'all remember the days of the phone booth? (laughs) Yes, the yellow pages were chained to the booth so everyone could use them. And third, did the church put the Bible into Latin? Yes, but not so nobody could read it. It was so more people could read it. Back then, most educated people still read and wrote Latin. So this action by the church of putting the Bible into Latin greatly increased the reach of the Bible to more people. Now, is the Bible all we need? Do we believe in sola scriptura, meaning Bible only? No. The last chapter of the Gospel of John tells us that Scripture is necessary but not sufficient. It says all the books of the world could not contain all the things Jesus said and did. So does that mean those things that he said and did, which are not in the Bible, are unimportant? Of course they're important. In fact, they are just as important as what is written in the Bible. When you communicate with someone You don't just do it through a written letter. You also do it through the spoken word that is not written down. Both are valid ways to communicate, and both are ways God has communicated with mankind throughout history. By saying we can only follow what is written in the Bible, we are saying all those things God gave us through sacred tradition, passed down orally by God's direction, are meaningless. Sola Scriptura is not in the Bible, but oral tradition is, as we see in 2 Thessalonians 2.15. This makes sense, because 9 out of 10 early Christians could not read. So, how did they learn their faith? Not from the Bible, but from sacred tradition. Jesus never promised us a book, but he promised us an authority, the church. So, they are both equally important. And Jesus gave his authority to the church to give us scripture and act in his name. We see this in John 20, 23, Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, and Matthew 18, 18, for example. As we said a few weeks ago, 1 Timothy 3, 15 says the church is the pillar and bulwark of truth tells us what makes up the Bible and how to live our life regarding faith and morals. This is how all Christians viewed it in the earliest centuries. It is how God set it up. And that is why you can't have the Bible without the church. And that is why the Bible is a book from the Catholic Church. Now, let's hear the story of Ginny Schrappen, who had a prison pen pal, and following the Bible by visiting those in prison, both lives were changed, and he was set free. I grew up in the streets in South St. Louis, and it was a very Catholic area. My parents were what I call very involved, very active Catholics. They not only got involved at my local parish, St. Thomas, but they reached beyond that. My mother, she was always involved in some prayerful community. And my dad was very involved in the St. Vincent Paul Society for 25 years. 
We were encouraged to volunteer. So that broadened my scope. Then I got married, I had children, and my husband thought it would be good for me to teach in a Catholic school, and so I did. Although Jenny was a busy wife, mother, and teacher, she never lost sight of the invaluable lessons her parents demonstrated in being sensitive to the needs of the poor and having an open heart when opportunities come knocking. It was right around in the mid-90s. I was the lead of the Pax Christi group when our deacon at the time said, could you get somebody to write? I've got this young man who's been sentenced to prison for life. I firmly believe he's innocent. I think he had been involved in prison ministry at the time, and he met Lamar at one of the prisons that's not too far from here. Well, of course, that's all I had to hear. And I thought, well, you don't need to get somebody else to write him. You can do it. Lamar's a young man, barely 20. I'm going to be behind bars the rest of my life for something I didn't do. I can't even imagine the thoughts, how depressing that would be. And I guess Deacon Dick could see that. Some outside contact was going to be paramount to keeping this man alive and to help him survive. So I started writing Lamar, and he wrote me, and his penmanship was just fantastically flawless. And his the content of his letters was so good. You could tell this man was intelligent, you know, good grammar, good everything. And so he was easy to write to. He would respond and not sad. You know, he had a good spirit. And, you know, I tried to be upbeat in my letters as well. Lamar was convicted of murdering his best friend. And he told me, you know, he, he, we didn't talk about any of that too long, but he would, he would share with me. That was my best friend. Marcus was my best friend. I, I wouldn't have shot Marcus. I wasn't even near the place. And that was when his daughters were just babies. Well, he's not gonna kill his best friend. He certainly didn't wanna leave those babies and go to prison, leave his mom. Yeah, I can remember him, you know, talking fondly about his grandma and I, remembered my grandma fondly, and his grandma died when he was in prison. I knew he wanted me to visit him, and I was hesitant to do it. I didn't want to do it by myself, and I didn't know the process or anything, but I said to myself, you know, that is one of the carpal works of mercy. Jenny's husband had passed away several years prior, but she was able to find a parishioner who would drive with her down to the prison. And because she used to volunteer and throw birthday parties at the County Juvenile Detention Center for teenagers, her processing to go visit Lamar was quickly accepted. You know, I didn't know what to expect. You know, you had to put their name down and who you're visiting, their number, they all have a number. And then you sit and wait for them to come in. They only come in a few at a time. And so we were at a table. It reminded me of a cafeteria because I had taught in so many schools. And you're just sitting there waiting. And then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, there he was. And it was just, it was just a thrill. He's easy to talk to. He's, he's just a genuine, lovely person. Amazingly, he doesn't hold animosity because he said that would be another prison for me. I had to let that go. And he did. I mean, that's just, that's just amazing. Over the years, we'd have demonstrations or something downtown. And then in the summer of 2017, we thought we were gonna get some place. There's gonna be a hearing, and his lawyers were there from the Innocence Project. Many of us went to support Lamar, and his daughters were there, of course. And that judge at the time said, I don't know what to do with this. This is not going to go any place. We don't have the legislation. And so that was a setback. Then Lamar went back to Jeff City, and we continued to visit him in Jeff City. And I can remember going in for a lot of these hearings and listening to the lawyers. I learned a lot at those hearings, but I never questioned his innocence. Over the next five years, Jenny would continue to write Lamar faithfully, holding out all hope that one day he would receive his vindication in court but not everyone around her was so supportive. I will admit, some people that I knew, you're what? They questioned me. You're writing a prisoner? And I said, I am. Well, you're not using your return address, I hope. I don't know what they were thinking. Somebody was gonna come and kidnap me? I, I don't know. I said, of course I use my return address. Then, then you think, oh my gosh, should I have done that? No, I didn't think, I didn't dwell on any of that. Sometimes you have to take a leap of faith. My parents did a lot of things that I know was extraordinary for them to do. And so you, you do that. So you go out on a limb, so to speak. You, you put yourself out there. This is what Jesus has called us to do. 
He knew I was a Catholic, and he knew I went to church frequently. And I remember saying the chaplet for him, and saying, get him out of prison. He's innocent, get him out of prison. He wasn't too faithful when he went into prison, but someone gave him a Bible, and he became much more faithful. So now 18, 19, 20, and this legislation happened in 21, 22 that enabled Kim Gardner, our prosecuting attorney, to refile and get the hearing. It was the week of the 14th of December, I think, and that was five days of full-time hearing. And then they, you know, eventually put Lamar on the stand, and that's when the judge said, I will rule on this. So this was a special day. His hearing was gonna be on Valentine's Day, 2023. I got to the courthouse around 1.30. By two o'clock, he ruled I vacate his, his sentence. It was over. Lamar's daughter was sitting just one person away from me, and she just put her head down and cried, and her fiancé was next to her, and I mean, we're all just crying, tears of joy and tears of happiness, and Lamar's crying. And then we stuck around, you know, till he, he physically got released. I was a pen pal with Lamar for 25 years. I felt that Jesus said to me, I'm proud of you. But no, I, I can't say I thought of it a whole lot. If you're a Catholic, this is what you do. You write people that don't have anybody to write them. Anybody could do it. You just have to, well, you have to have that, that inner strength. I'm doing the right thing. And you do it. You act on it. I mean, that right, my parents did. Don't just be thinking about it. Do it. Yesterday, our pastor at Mass talked on the mercy of God. And you know how important that is for us to practice that mercy. And you don't always put that on yourself, though. You know, I, I, you know, you just you just do the right thing. If you're doing the right thing, you're probably going to have mercy. I think my parents would be proud of me. My mother, yeah. Now let's hear in our Saints in Focus segment about St. Martin of Tours, whose feast day is coming up in a couple days, and who lived the Bible. This is Brother Stephen. Hello, I'm Brother Stephen Camara, a seminarian with the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and this is Saints in Focus. Martin of Tours is most famous for a single act of mercy. As a young soldier, Martin met a beggar on the road whose clothing was all in rags. So with his sword, Martin divided his warm military cloak in half, giving one half to the beggar. That night, he saw Jesus coming to him in a dream, wearing the cloak and thanking him. But did you know that Martin of Tours later became a monk, a bishop, and a champion of nonviolent resistance to both pagans and heretics. Martin was born in the 300s in modern-day Hungary. He initially followed his father in a military career, but after just two years, he felt called to a life of peace. So he went to study under Hilary of Poitiers and built a house of monastic life that soon drew other followers. After he was exiled a while for opposing the Arian heresy, he returned and was chosen Bishop of Tours by popular acclaim. In that diocese, he established an early version of the parish system. Although he firmly opposed both pagans and heretics, he was very merciful and deterred the emperor and other leaders who wanted to imprison and execute them. When he was about to die, his people urged him not to leave them, and he prayed, Lord, if your people still need me, I am ready for the task. Your will be done. At his death, his contemporary Sulpicius Severus said, This is a man whom words cannot describe. Death could not defeat him, nor toil dismay him. He did not fear death, nor did he refuse to live. Martin of Tours gives us an example of mercy for the poor and for those we disagree with. He shows us how to live in peace with others, 
not simply a negative peace that is the absence of conflict, but a positive, life-giving peace in which both people and nations can flourish. Peace, as Thomas Aquinas says, is not only the agreement between two people about something they desire, but also the harmony of every desire in each person towards the greatest good, the highest good, which is God himself. Today, as we reflect on the life of St. Martin of Tours, let's ask for the peace of soul which gives us an interior unity with God at the center. Then, with his peace in our heart, we can spread peace among the people we live and work with. And maybe we too will be remembered after our death by the little acts of mercy we did for others. St. Martin of Tours, pray for us. And interestingly for us, when I had moved to Singapore, it was a struggle to find the right church, so we visited many of the churches. And when we went to the Church of Divine Mercy, five minutes into the service, we looked at each other and said, this, this is, is our, our church. church. Yes. Because the chaplet was the moving part. And we do our chaplet at the Sun Mass at Saturday evening Mass before Mass every Saturday. So that is special for the both of us. Well, it means everything to me because everything in, that's happened to me in my life, the mercy from God has always been there through the struggles. I always have struggles, but after I'm through them and look back, I see the hand of the Lord in them, and especially the mercy that he gives to everyone. And I like to tell the story of she, her best friend growing up was an Islamic girl, and they knew each other forever. They're the same age. And as this girl yeah. matured into maturity, she converted to Catholicism. And she is one of the most faithful Catholics that I have ever met. She actually helped us do our wedding. Yes. She was one of the, <laughs> the main reader for our wedding. And her name is now Grace, and she's just a beautiful person. And it just shows how when you reach out to others with the story of God and the gospel, everybody can come to know Jesus. Well, <clears throat> when you live in Singapore, we have a different culture. You have Chinese, Malay, Indian, and others. Others would be like him, others, expats, yeah, expatriates, Eurasians, yeah. and Eurasians. So when we grew up being multicultural, we have many religions. So my friend, who I'm, my best friend, she's six. Well, we've known each other since six years old. So we never thought of, oh, you're Islamic, I'm a Christian, and we don't friend each other. No, we, we went to an Anglican school. We grew up in an Anglican school, but then both of us, we convert to Catholics uh, later in life. So what is interesting is that it never bothered us that uh, you have a different religion and we have And she became a Catholic before I became a Catholic. And one thing that is very beautiful is we are not forced into the faith. The, we kind of flow into it you know, in our time when we are ready. So this is what happens. Still, the Word of God will not pass away. God's utterance is living. Difficulties will not suppress the works of God, but show that they are God's. Today, I felt the nearness of my mother, my heavenly mother. I clearly feel her protection over me. I entreat her to be so gracious as to enkindle in me the fire of God's love, such as burned in her own pure heart at the time of the incarnation of the Word of God. You have indeed prepared a tabernacle for yourself, the Blessed Virgin. Her immaculate womb is your dwelling place. 
and the inconceivable miracle of your mercy takes place, O Lord. The Word becomes flesh. God dwells among us. The Word of God, mercy incarnate. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us this week about the Bible. And we'd like to share with you a, an amazing tool that you can use in your faith. This is the Divine Mercy Catholic Bible. The information's there on your screen. And what it is is the full um, approved translation, Catholic translation of the Bible, but also inserted in between every few pages is an explanation of God's mercy and how it's at work in the scripture passages. So again, the information's there on your screen. We hope you'll get a copy. And please be with us next week because the Bible talks a lot about how we use our body and how the spirit should control the flesh. So our topic will be theology of the body. So we hope you'll be with us. And until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.